You can wear mine if you want. <laughs> okay, Hank. Now this is the kind of hard part. You just gotta turn around and just land your butt there if you can. <laughs> pushing on really hard, you should let go. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to do it. Okay. He said he didn't. We're gonna go bust us some ducks. <laughs> <laughs> you got a shotgun, take a <laughs> we'll go fly up over Cub Lake and see if there's any property that he still owns up there. I'm just gonna think alive, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's wrong. Raise the landing gear. <laughs> I did it. Yeah. Did he not come back? Oh. Wait. Okay. Wait, darling.
<laughs> Monday I'll probably order one. <laughs> well, how was it, Henry? Yeah. Henry, how was it? Can't hear. So, Henry, how was it? Great. Should we get one? Yeah. That's <laughs> good. That's called service. There you go, Hank. Good. Here you go, Henry. Did you record that? Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Good shot. Good shot. All right. All right. Hope you enjoyed that, Hank. I, I did. did. Yeah, I did. Oh. Anyway, there's that one. So we're just talking about flying and stuff. I should have let you fly the other day, but. <laughs> it's pretty fun, though, wasn't it? Yeah, I really enjoyed that trip. It was, it was a fun trip. Had good weather for it. The next day it was cold and windy. But hey, when did you start flying? Well, what year? Yeah, I mean, like, how old were you? And uh, when I was going to high school, this uh, friend of mine, uh, his dad had owned an airplane, and I used to go to the airport and go around and did a little. He took me up, gave me a few lessons. I started. So you're like, you're like 16 so or something? That's why I got to, uh, I was about 18 years old then. Huh. But uh, that's why I got interested in flying and wanted to fly. I applied for uh, Uncle Sam Air Force, but at that time the restrictions were so pretty, pretty bad and I didn't have the college, I was just getting out of high school. Well, was that close to World War II draft time? Well, yeah, it was draft time. He was going into draft time, so <clears throat> and I wanted to invest the ship in drafters so I could get, try to get into flying. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, went, uh, I was living on a dairy farm, and uh, one of my jobs was washing bottles. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in those days, we had less bottles. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a big barrel sitting out behind the creamery that uh, any bottles we had, that we couldn't clean. And so people would put gas in and everything else, so we couldn't. So I just threw them in that barrel. Well, one day I forgot to turn my head quick enough. And I got a piece of glass in one eye. So I lost the revision, but it was coming back. The vision was coming back. Because when I went down and took my physical, they turned me down. Oh. Because of the eyes, they wouldn't. It had to be perfect, they said. Yeah. Well, did you end up in the Air Force or the Army? or? I, I was trying to get in. With, I heard then this, uh, I got uh, word that it was the uh, Canadian Air Force. The Canadians were recruiting. So there's a couple of buddies of mine and myself, we went up to Windsor, Ontario, just across from Detroit. And uh, went over and took the uh, uh, test and uh, applied for it and so forth. And well, the guy said, well, come back tomorrow and we'll give you the results of it. But 
stories. So I went back and they said, well, you're, you're uh, uh, as, it's, as a scar, but it's telling you it's improving. So that's the whole problem that, that uh, you've got two choices. Uh, you can uh, go out to Edmonton and go to college, get your two-year college degree, and then you'll be eligible for any promotion in the Air Force if you, if you make the grade in the Air Force. Or you could just go in and now and uh, without going to college and take the chance to drop me there for more or whatnot. Well, I, I was gambling on time anyway, in fact. <laughs> so I uh, gave a first chance to get my education that I wanted to get, and so I did. I ended up in Edmonton and hey, uh, about about a years, less than a year's time. In about eight months, uh, they run through two year college course and then the flight training. And so so uh, I took my basic training at Edmonton and went down to uh, 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 oh, there's two or three bases that were there. I think we had one of them was Red Deer and, and Calvary. Anyway, I was. Uh, getting to my graduation, I was up there at the time of the war. Hmm. In fact, Pearl Harbor Day, I was out on a solo flight and been uh, out for oh, an hour or so and came back and there was nobody on the flight line. And I thought, well, that's unusual. It's always somebody on the flight line. There's both of the ends right over the park and so forth. There. It wasn't a soul. I, Pulled up in front of the hangar and got out, and I went in, and they were all in the hangar listening to the radio. Oh, yeah. Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so that's where I was when that happened. So uh, I, uh, in, in high school, I had a, a coach that was an old pop shooter. I, I have to give a lot of credit to him, to my education of, of life through him. He was a wonderful person. I always respect a lot of his thoughts and ideas and so forth. But uh, he was a retired uh, naval officer. And when the war broke out, well, they called him back into service. And he was pretty high up in Washington. And we were corresponding and so forth. He wrote me and said, Hank, if you want to transfer back, they just set tight that we're in the process of of uh, making a deal with Canada to bring you guys all back to the States if you want to come. <laughs> and to get some ready trained pilots. <laughs> yeah. And so it ended up, uh, that's what they did. They, I got worried that they, uh, this uh, train was coming through and anybody that wanted to apply to, to come back to the States would take it to go in. So, when I took my flight checks and everything there, why they left, no, it was all. <laughs> they didn't want me. Well, were you, did you get assigned it, did you go as an instructor right away, or did, no, what, what no, was your no. first job? No, I, I, <laughs> and I, I didn't understand either why it was my first job, but I, uh, uh, I ended up at Long Beach, California, in the uh, third division of ATC. Oh. So I ended up to start with, and I was there for, oh, I must have been there about a year, I guess. Ferrying aircraft from there to yeah. other places? Or just ferrying. I'd, uh, uh, I got checked out practically everything that we had. Uh, I'd get up in the morning, go to operations, and have orders uh, go down to uh, Burbank and pick up P-38 number so-and-so take it to Newark. And when I get each night we were paid for R O N, send the cell back so that they knew exactly where we were each night. And when I get to Newark it'd be a telegram, either return to B R O B return to base or proceed to Miami and pick up B seventeen and take it to Seattle. Really? And, yeah, and, and so sometimes I'd be gone for a week or two to stop from one one place to another before I sure. finally get back to you checked out in a lot of planes and have done a lot of cross-country flying. That was it. There was no uh, 
And I, I get orders for an airplane I've never seen her before. I don't check out no nothing. You, just, you learn to fly that airplane. <laughs> I kind of know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of experience that way. And it flies. And uh, finally, uh, uh, I ended up over in uh, 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 Reno out of uh, Long Beach as an instrument instructor. And I spent oh, I didn't, I, I, just about a year there, eight, eight ten months anyway. And uh, when I left, out of Reno, they sent me to uh, China or India and uh, flying the hunks. In this thing right here? Yeah, that, that was one of them right there. The B-17? Yeah, the B-17 and, and the uh, uh, DC-3 or DC-4. And my dad was, told me that you all you had was a 45 caliber pistol? <laughs> That's all. Really? All we had, yeah. Flying over that, the Burma hump? Well, that's if we have to go down, well, that was the only survival we had was a pistol. Gee. And, uh, we just, what were you, were you just hauling cargo and stuff and supplies? We were, our outfit was uh, mostly uh, uh, for uh, uh, passenger service, the airline division of the ATC. But if we didn't have a load, they put anything in there. <laughs> if you was making a trip, right? Uh, they have a bunch of brooms or uh, any of what your car going to be. Pretty romantic stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. We always went out and loaded went with something or other. Huh. And, uh, it, it was a wonderful incident, speaking of the 45. I, uh, when I got out of Atlanta, where I get out, I always take my 45 and lay it under the seat. Because it was comfortable, uncomfortable anyway to have it on. And uh, I went in, and then when I get out, I take, take it, take it in there with me. And one day I forgot to, and I had to realize that I didn't have my gun, so I sold it. My uh, co pilot was with me. I said, Go get my pistol. I said, I left it sit under the seat. He comes back and said, It's gone. It's not there. But it was, it was about 25 coolies. I started unloading the airplanes. It was unloading. So I went out and got over the head coolie and wrapped him around. And he uh, lined them all up. And uh, I couldn't understand what all he was saying, but I could, you know, he was giving them hell and so forth. And finally, one guy, he went over and grabbed him out of the line. <laughs> took him over and I, got, I was standing in the airplane. I got pictures and I just stood like in front of him. So it, uh, it shot him right there. Shot him? Yeah. Yeah. Dead? <laughs> yeah, right. It killed him? I, I guess he killed him, but I didn't go out there and get See, but they shot him. He crumbled down and they drug him off. Did you get your gun back? Uh, no, I had got my gun back. But he had the gun, see, that was the one that... Gee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the life for those people. Those, uh, you'd have to live with them, uh, be over there for a while to understand their... Uh, to them, uh, life isn't uh, it's, it's like a bird or an insect to us, you might say. Yeah. yeah there's, there's no respect for life at all. Huh. Yeah. You know, a lot of incidents that way. We had uh, 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 all the coolies that would hire them to work along the runways, didn't build the runways and so forth. That if you hired the the old man and the whole family come. And uh, so this uh, little kid got right over and it was an airplane one day and <laughs> so they, they made a settlement of five dollars for him. To like the kids. He, well then we had a rash with his kids getting killed. So they paid five dollars for an accident when the kid got yeah. killed and then the whole Yeah. Then they started getting killed a lot after that. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, they get send their kids out to get the so they get that five dollars. Their own parents, huh? Yeah, that's 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 what they saw their life or what they were expecting life. Yeah. Well, when you got out of there, then where'd you head to? Yeah, I left my life. I left. Uh, well, I, <coughs> uh, one day I made uh, more of the trips. So he was only supposed to fly the hump, put so many hours in, and so many trips and whatnot. And I was well over my quota 
And I kept asking the CEO to get this, this transfer back. And, oh, no, he wouldn't. I went in one day and he, he called me in. He said, Horace, I got orders for you here. I said, good, I got orders to go home, huh? He said, oh, no, not that. I said, what are you talking about? He said, we got to close it up a, a nurse, or the hospital, I guess it was. Up in the SM Valley, eh, we need to send you up there to take over to close up the base and so forth. I said, I'm not a ground man. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm not going to go up there and take over that base. And he said, well, you either do that or you, you have to get your discharge. He said, uh, I said, you mean to say that I either take that position up there or I, you're going to discharge me? He said, yep, that's it. I said, well, I've been trying to get back to the States, and I guess that'll do it. <laughs> that's how you got out. <laughs> and that's how I got out. I got it back. Got back and, uh, huh. Then, uh, was first of all, I tried the orchard business, and uh, unluckily I got, it, got off on the wrong foot on that. But, uh, I uh, was going down to the airways. Uh, uh, when that air service had a, uh, uh, a flight training school, you know, you're, they, uh, you're in a war, they uh, had these uh, uh, GIs that would, well, in fact, they had an Air Force training school in one at one time. And uh, that's where Ernie worked for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they had this uh, put in a seaplane base up here so that they could uh, extend their uh, license aboard by getting a seaplane ready. So uh, in other words, they could run the students through the regular wheel uh, land base and, by, and the seaplane, well, they could run them through for another 20 hours or so. More <laughs> money. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what they did. So I... Uh, we went down and rented an airplane to go up to. I heard about Dumpy Lake and fishing and so forth, so I went down and rented an airplane and went up. Did that three or four times and I came back one day from flying and uh, oh, uh, uh, it came back in, in Park Hill, it was who had owned it, I think. And uh, Park Hill was in the office and I came in. And, he asked me, said, well, don't you uh, take on some students and you won't have to rent that airplane. So you'll be able to use it without it. He said, yes. And so I did. I thought, he said, well, I'd have to do it at my time. I'd right where I had time to do it. schedule. And that's how I got involved with Cheyenne Airways. And, yeah, it was uh, flying for Gwinnett's Earth Service there with that. And, and that was, went on for about one summer there, uh, Park Hill called me in and said, uh, we're going to close it up. We're going to go out. not enough students to work with now to keep us feelable for us. I said, well, what do you want for it? <laughs> I said, I got started. So I uh, brought a couple of airplanes from them. How much time we got going left? Cause I got no, what, what's that camera? No, no. Yeah, just look real close down inside, see if it reads out how much time. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'll get Seventeen forty-two. Did you see? Okay. Um, ninety-two minutes left. But, oh, okay, okay, we got we got lots of time. I didn't know how much time that camera had. Go ahead, Hank. So you bought a business that was going to shut down anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, I had. Uh, uh, oh, four or five students. Uh, it, it was a couple of them that they uh, were, was in training with them, and then I picked up three or four more. But the thing that I was wanted was for the tourist business. That's the way I looked at it. it a, for flying up lake and fishing, uh, taking fishing trips. I was planning on making some more trips into Canada. It was. Well, was Gordon Stewart already up at Donkey then? Yeah, yeah. Was he? Gordon started before I started. Okay, and then 
You could yeah. fly into Cub Lake too. Yeah. Yeah. And Trapper. Trapper Lake. Cub Lake. And did you guys? Because I worked for Ernie for like seven, about seven years, but I, I forgot. So yeah. maybe you remember. Did Did Ernie plant or did you plant that you Trapper Lake full of fish? Oh, or yeah, we planted it. You guys did. Yeah. I mean, it didn't have any native fish in it, did it or did? It? Well. Uh, I don't know whether they did have it or not, because it, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a couple, I think Ernie is one that uh, ended up doing it. He was uh, designated to, to, to drop him somewhere else. I know one, one load of pretzels that was supposed to go into uh, Cub Lake, uh, I dropped it in, in uh, Dunkey Lake. How come? I couldn't get in the cup. <laughs> <laughs> Tell anybody? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's all right, fellas. I couldn't get in the cup, so I had to get rid of those fish. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's crazy things. Then. Did Did you guys Did you leave an airplane at at Chub Lake one time? Left one at Chub Lake. Because I know that years ago, I'm 54, and I think I was probably 15 years old. And there was an, an old airframe up there, and my dad said, that's Hank Harvey's airframe. <laughs> I want to hear about that. Well, it was <laughs> one of these, uh, uh, yeah, I'll make a mistake sometimes, but flying is, is a, it won't excuse you. You can't make mistakes hard in flying. And uh, I uh, made the mistake, and he admitted it. I, I went in, I was going in and out, and on a real... Uh, clear, uh, calm morning. You there, calm day. I go in and have about uh, close to 800 feet, about higher than the lake, because the lake is, as you know, uh, it, it it drops off at the face of the lake for about a thousand feet or so, just off, yeah. right off the lake. Makes Prince Creek, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes Prince Creek. Yeah. And uh, if it uh, if the weather was good, I'd, I'd hold about uh, 300 feet and come around the, the, into the mouth of the canyon. And if everything was fine, I'd go ahead and sit down. And uh, if, if there's any wind or anything, I'd go on up the canyon and land coming out instead of going in. And uh, this morning, it was. Uh, I was loaded pretty heavy, and I had a beautiful morning. It just there wasn't a ripple in the air, and everything was great. So I held my altitude over the lip, beginning the lip, to make sure I didn't get a downdraft right as you cross that lip. Because you will get a downdraft in there sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I always had a couple of hundred feet. But as soon as I got over the lip, and I put it in a, a side slip it so I could drop it quick. And I, when I brought it out of my side slip, the sun had just popped over the lake, and I looked in the mirror. Just, just that's, that's two or three seconds or seconds of my city. Glassy water. Glassy water. And I, all I saw was a mirror. There was nothing there. And I, so I tried to jerk it out and get it straight, and bang! I hit the water a little too hard, or it jammed the slip. And the controls for the air lines, it, it runs up that uh, shoulder on the instruction. Give me slack. I didn't have any control. Well, so it wasn't the only thing I could do was open the door and shut the engine and tell the to hang on. <laughs> <laughs> we hit and bounced and hit and it tripped over. And so it, wasn't, uh, it just turned upside down on us. We got out all right. It was uh, an old fellow that uh, I can't think of his name, but he used to go up and down the lake in a rowboat. And he hiked into the, all the different lakes, and he loved to hike back in the hills, camp. I think Stony or something like that, that is his name. But he was uh, he just wasn't quite to, at the lake that morning when I went over. And he said, he said I heard, heard you land. He said, I knew it wasn't your normal landing. He said, I knew something was wrong. So he hurried up, got up there while we were out there on the floats. I saw him walking along the shore. He waved at us. I said, Bruce, shove that log or shove it out here toward us so we can get something. 
to get that. He says, oh, no, man, I need to get nothing. So we swam over there, got in the shore, all right. And while we was getting in, he had, by the time we got in, he had a good fire going. It was kind of dry a little bit. And so I told, uh, I had Don Broughton, his wife, was two of them, so I, I told them, I said, well, I'm going to try to get to the uh, landing. Uh, and I asked uh, Sony right in front of me, I said, Sony, can you get down to the point the boat gets by? And he said, well, he tried. After, after he left and I got kind of dried out and she realized I was able, I might say, uh, I dropped some teeth out and I busted a few ribs, was bleeding in the mouth and I didn't know just what condition I was in, but I knew I was able to move. So uh, I decided I wasn't going to give up on it. Yep getting it down there in time, so I tried to get down myself, or decided I'd better get out of there because I, I knew Ernie would be, after a certain time, would be looking. See, so I said, well, I'd, I'd like to get to the dock before Ernie comes in to look for me again. And so I, I took off and got down where the French Creek meets this uh, other little creek the crossing. That's the first time I sit down to rest. I or knock off a few and I tried to get up and I said, oh, I'm stiff, I couldn't get up. <laughs> I rolled over against the rock and got back on my feet. I said, that's the last time I'll sit down. <laughs> so I kept really pouring it on. And I, when I got down to coming off the cliffs there next to the creek, I landed. Uh, Ernie went up the lake. And so I put on a little more steam and when he come back out I was out on the end of the dock waving at him. At Prince Creek? At Prince Creek, yeah. He saw you? And uh, yeah he, he saw me and come in and landed, picked me up, took me up to uh, Lucerne and uh, they took me up to the hospital up there again from Lucerne. Hmm. And, and then they flew back up and got the guys out? Yeah, the yeah, passengers? I, well, they, they finally hiked out. They, they, they were about two hours behind me, but they did get out. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was one of those, uh, <coughs> like I told him, see, it's better, you know, it can happen. The guy just... I, Glassy water, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been myself flown, yeah. thinking I'm... 20 feet off the water and all of a sudden I'm bam, <laughs> I'm on the water. <laughs> like a boy. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So then how long, let me see if the camera's still running because we'll edit this stuff. <coughs> I want to set a uh, record. Yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah. Okay, great. So then I'll, uh, did you just, how long did you have there with Hank? Uh, mm, <coughs> four or five years. Oh, really? What were you flying, like Piper Cubs or something? I had uh, Piper Cubs and uh, Erotica Sedan and uh, Sea Beats. Now, I know when I hear that word, I worked long enough for Ernie that he yeah. hated those Sea Beats. Is that right? Well, I, <laughs> it, it, uh, it wasn't an airplane, really. But uh, when I first, the first one I got, it had uh, float or had wheels on it, and uh, which then created when, when they designed the thing, the engineers made a mistake uh, or their weights and balances, and to, to that, to that the wheels on it, they had to put I think it was about 80 pounds of lead in the nose of it. Oh. To, to balance, make the same balance out. Uh, try to hold the lid. I don't remember the exact way. So I got to study a spec on it one day. And I said, no, I got this way here. I got this way I got this way here. I'm going to take the wheels off and take that lid out of there and see what it does. See what it does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And I, I talked to the inspector about it. And, I, and I, he said, oh, I said, that. Yeah, I'll prove you've tried it if you want to experiment with it. I've made an airplane out of it. 
Hmm. It actually did. It did. It actually did. It 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 well, earlier he was working for an air service when I thought. Oh, that's right. Him. He was an instructor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah instructor for them. And I tried to hire him right then. I said, "Hurry up! I'll need him some help." And I said, tried to hire him. Oh, he's he was gonna go over back to Portland. That's where he was from. That's where his mother lived in Portland. He said, "I'm going back to get out there for a while." And okay. Well, I, I heard this uh, big kid. Oh yeah. That, I know. I remember him. You remember that guy? Yeah. Uh, Matter of fact, yeah. he came became the publisher of Remote Control Modeler magazine. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. He was. He just died about seven or eight years ago or something. It's been something like that. Yeah. yeah. But I met. He he came up every summer when I worked at the Airways and yeah. said hello. Yeah. And brought him brought Ernie a yeah, model yeah. airplane. Ernie. Yeah. I think Dick worked on the thing for a year, and Ernie looked at it for five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. go, go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, Dick kid, you hired him, or yeah. I did. He worked before me. And, uh, Ernie, Ernie uh, uh, I told him when he left. I said, "Well, you got a job anytime you want it." Well, it was about a year. The next spring, I think, or summer, he was up here. And he came up on vacation, and so I told uh, Dick that. that uh, I said, let's take Ernie up to Trapper. So I started doing it to Trapper after Ernie left. See? And I said, let's take, that, take Ernie up to Trapper. So we took him up fishing one day and or not. He got a little enthused. <laughs> 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 so uh, when he left, I said, well, Ernie, that job's still open. Uh, all of a month or two, he called me. Huh. Said Hank, I'm coming back. Good. So, uh, and then uh, he was back with me for about six months when Dick left. And huh. Dick, yeah, he went back to publishing that magazine. Yeah. That, uh, he was quite a uh, 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 a model airplane builder. He, he built he, he built built his flying models. He, yeah, he he was pretty famous actually with his remote control. Yeah, I mean very yeah. serious equipment that he had. He brought that one uh, big one up and uh, as old air base there, and we took it out and we were going to fly it as before the uh, golf. No, the golf course just about the time the golf course was in again. And uh, laid it up, just flying through it. All of a sudden, she quit, and so Ernie uh, did start discussing. Said, "Who's got their radios on?" Oh, so Carl Brown, who got on his ham radio, and, and messed and it up. Messed it up. Hank's going to tell us a story that Marcy brought up. <laughs> yeah. I guess this is a nationwide famous story. So start, start over, Hank, because I think we missed the first part on the last part. It's a story about the booze. Start over about the booze. Huh? Running booze up the lake on the in the airplane to Holden Village. <laughs> you know, sorry to begin. Yeah, yeah, because I think we missed it. Well, uh, back in those days, the liquor board to buy a bottle of booze, they had to sign for it. And uh, the uh, Holden boys, the miners, uh, couldn't get access to booze. They tried to get the liquor store to open a place up there, which they didn't want to do, and they finally came up with a, a letter to the local uh, things and the local store operator, and myself, authorizing us to sign for the miners if they wanted to uh, legalize it for us to do that. So I took uh, the first envelopes up to uh, the rec hall that uh, was fellas that, that they wanted to, if you went in and wanted a bottle of stigums or whatnot, you wrote it on the envelope and put the money in the envelope and give it to the bus driver and he brought it down to the CERN and we picked it up 
down with chili water. I go in and give it to the uh, pigs at the time. And we always, uh, uh, if there any change left, or we always well, it went back in the envelope. I never knew how much was in it, or it, we never. It was a courtesy thing. It wasn't a, didn't charge a penny for this at all. And uh, well, this uh, one fellow he uh, decided he was going to do a little bootlegging. And he false, write false names on envelopes and send them down. And I didn't know that he was doing it. He was, he was, that way he was accumulating a little bit for the holidays and the oh. weekend. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, somebody got, one of the miners got put this off me about, for some reason, turned him in. And so uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney, we, uh, this, Lawyer, he uh, tried to make a case out of this deal. But, uh, what he did, he, he went up and picked up the, the uh, bootlegger, and called him, and the stupid Jack Ash was keeping a record of his operation. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, he had a notebook. The correct writing things down. Yeah. Uh, God. <laughs> So, uh, and how he was getting it, well, he, he picked the bootlegger up and he picked up the uh, uh, bus driver. It was the, the connections between us Sir and Holden, and uh, he had a one sword out for Ernie and Dick and I. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bootlegger. Yeah, uh, 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 was kept to serve at that time. Yeah, I remember Very that. good friend of mine. I, he was, we, and I did a lot of work for the for the, for the, for the, uh, the police departments. Uh, flies up lake and things, you know. But we were good friends. Well, Mona came out and told me, he said, Hank said, I've got warrants here for you and Ernie and Dick, and I, I, I've got instructions not to serve them until after 5 o'clock. This was a Saturday, and uh, I said, well, golly, what, what, what's the deal on it? And he said, that's all I know. He said, I was told not to serve these until after 5 o'clock. And, and he said, I think it's for a bootlegging charge or something like that. And, well, it was this connection deal once. So anyway, uh, I called uh, Nick Jeffries, which was a good, good client of mine. I took him flying a lot. And Vic said, well, don't leave Salan until I hear back from me. And so he got a hold of the judge, and, yeah, and they said, well, there was no bond set. Uh, Dick said, yes, there will be, too. So Dick, was, he knew enough that the guy had to, they couldn't put us in without setting a bond. The mm -hmm. way he had he, he it. Well, he was trying to put us in after the bags closed, and Put, he wanted oh. to close without my operation, that's what he was trying to do. So he wanted to put us in jail. So he couldn't bail out. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> to come out in the paper and then the big headlines. <laughs> and I, I've got to stop in the Daily World sometime and see if I can get a copy of that. Really? Go back and copy that. Big headlines. Arrow bootlegging ring broke. <laughs> <laughs> and it went out on Associated Press. <laughs> Really? Ernie's mother called up and said, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You said, Marcy said you had family from back east that called you? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did the call and everywhere I wanted. <laughs> yeah. So it was a nationwide story. Yeah, it was. It's an associated press. <laughs> yeah, we uh, <laughs> saw it around and saw it around in and, and uh, Finally, Dick called back and said, come on down, you guys. Flatter <laughs> <laughs> uh, came over and picked us up. Uh, it's $1,500, $500 a piece, what would that? And I said, where in the hell am I going to get that much money tonight, Saturday night? And I stopped into uh, Don Mathers, a motel down there, a hotel at Lower just at the end of the bridge there, mm -hmm. good, good friend, and 
so forth. And I said, well, I'll let me down now, so I can. So I told him what was going on. So I said, I said, if I work, I'd get 1500 bucks. He said, yeah, cash. And he said, oh, wait a minute. And uh, he went to the back room, and two minutes later, he came back, sat there and counted out $1,500. And I said, I, I, I don't have a check with me now. He said, don't check that. He said, you just go down there and tell Gordon Shelley or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we did. We, we went, Mara took us in while he, uh, the bailiff said, uh, said, empty your pockets. And I said, no, I'm not in my pockets. He said, yeah, you got to empty your pockets. He, said, <laughs> he was getting a little allergic about it. And Marta finally stepped up and said, well, now, it's, must, you must not be communicating because they do have, they all set now. But said, that thing was all so cut and dried. They knew I was coming. They had this thing, this set up. Really so locked up in jail that night. That's what they signed to. But they didn't. No, they couldn't do it. See, we had a whip. Uh, the bailiff, he got up and left the room, and a few minutes later, he'd come back, and said, well, uh, $1,500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then we went downtown and had dinner on the surf department. <laughs> <laughs> they finally dropped the charges, I guess, huh? Yeah. They, well, it was a... Uh, we tried in day just to get... The guy was trying, he was running for some position, or he brought some higher up position. And he was trying to make a name for himself, the prosecutor's attorney was. And uh, he thought it was big news, big deal, and all that. He said, well, it did turn out to be pretty big news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we finally uh, went to court on it. Well, uh, Dick Jeffries had and Hughes were my attorneys, and the uh, word got out from the, uh, uh, to this, the miners and whatnot, they got word that the uh, judge had been talking to them down there, and one thing or another, that it was kind of a cut and dried case, the judge said, you might as well give up, he was DSC. in other words, he had it set before he went to trial. Yeah. And uh, so they, uh, uh, Hughes and Jeffers, they uh, de demanded a, a different judge. Or, uh, they call us a probate judge. Anyways, uh, it's tell us, uh, you, can, you can ask for a new, different judge out of cases of this kind. Which they did, and got this, he was an Indian from OMAC. Wonderful guy, just an excellent. <coughs> and so they, uh, we ended up going to trial in the courtroom at the, the, uh, the uh, miners had got the, the uh, bootlegger that was the head of jail down there and told him if he qualified against Ernie and I or said anything, that he was a dead man. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Because they were really, they couldn't get any booze anymore. It, it was, he probably didn't go back to Holden, did he? No, I, <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to that guy. He ended up in so much time to serve. I, yeah. So we went to, went to court on it then. Uh, the judge, uh, they put this guy on trial. Uh, uh, Want to know if well, one of the things the judge said to ask, uh, he pointed at uh, me and at Ernie and he said, do you know those two guys there? And he kind of said to me, well, I've seen them before. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew that the miner had gotten to him. <laughs> and like that, then. Uh, so uh, the prosecutor brought these records uh, up and started to say, the judge said, well, you've got proof of this and so forth. He said, well, I've got these records here and so forth. The judge looked at him, where'd you get those records? He said, I just went up and got about out of the liquor store. I mean, he, said, he just pointed his finger at him. He said, you committed the worst crime and what's the charge of this class for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can remember right then, all that, that really is. 
<laughs> everything that the prosecutor would bring up, trying to case or whatnot, the judge would have some document right down. This we did. So it's finally he rested his case. He said, well, it, 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 so uh, it, it, judge, uh, we we asked for a recess in just before, it, and uh, we talked about it. he hadn't proved anything. He had he couldn't prove whether who signed when or what or uh, he didn't had no proof of those records or shouldn't have had the records and you know, it was just a, a really a, you could tell that the guy was trying to really had a case through. It just it was just well, and it just, the judge really wrote him down. <laughs> so we st we just said well he hadn't proved anything so we're we're just going to rest the case just like except for this. So we went back in, and the judge asked us what we did. So we rest. We don't contest. So whatever they want, however they reward it, and uh, so they turned it over to the jury. So we uh, went down to one of the restaurants to get something to eat and have a drink while we were waiting on the verdict. And about an hour ago, well, they called us and said, "Come on back." Not guilty. It's not that time. <laughs> not that time. <laughs> all, all the time, the time during in the court proceedings, there. So I, I tried to get the liquor board. That was another thing that happened. Uh, Don Roden had taken over the liquor store for them. And when this happened, it, Don got scared and he took that let's bill that letter back to Olympia instead of keeping it for me. Oh. And so I didn't have that dang letter. And he he admitted that he did it, but he wouldn't. I mean, he wouldn't do it. Anything. So I uh, had witnesses, or, or the fact that that letter was available, or was because of uh, it was really an issue to Pennington. So he Pennington do it, and I called last. And he said, "Yes, I do the letter somewhere." Huh. I said, "Well, would you come over and verify, swear to it, that that works there?" And he said, "It would." Well, and he was at court that day. He was there, but uh, and the uh, 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 guy from the uh, uh, liquor board was there. He didn't didn't say it. Didn't, uh, I happened to just luckily recognize him because I'd seen him once before on something else that uh, somebody had told me about. It. Anyway, I, I either me or the. the Lawyer recognized that this guy was from the liquor board, <laughs> but he, he didn't come and introduce himself and say who he was. He, he was just a uh, one of the spectators, you might say. <laughs> and I, I think that if it, and we, we were said to him, if it comes to the last thing we're going to spin him, we're going to grab him on in, right away if it comes down to that to that point. Yeah. And, but uh, we didn't have to. Huh. I mean, what you got there? Oh, that's just. Let me see. That's you got, there's a, did you ever find that picture, Marcy? Not? Picture, which picture is that? I remember when I was a kid sitting in your living room looking at uh, a picture of you in your uniform when you were flying this B 17. You had your hat tipped off to one side, and like the rest of them. Yeah, well, it could be in there. What is this here? That's just a, a scrapbook. From, uh, oh, I see. It's just a scrapbook. Yeah. A lot of different. There's pictures in there. It might be in there. Did you show them those two pictures of the, the plane? This is one, but that's not what you're looking for. Oh, that's a good one. No, it's not. I know it's not. And so much of our stuff is packed away, I'm not sure where. Yeah, of course. I got so doggone many pictures and crap and stuff. But, uh, that is a good one. Maybe I can get this thing to focus in. This, this thing, computers, I just can fix this right up. I got you a button for camera. Oh, no, I don't. Jimmy's. <laughs> Wow. 
Wow. Take those and put them on the computer and burn them, and then just make a it makes oh, beautiful okay. pictures of them. Did you fly that P forty Warhawk, Hank? Yeah, I uh, I think I saw it in there. Maybe it was a P fifty one B or something. Yeah, I was getting my own number and number and all that. <laughs> now, you look nice in a grass skirt there, Henry. <laughs> Jeez. <clears throat> oh, that's it. You can't see this on the on the camera, but here's Hank with a grass skirt on and a lay, and that's it. Well, no, he's got two lays around his ankles, too. Yeah. What the hell's that? <clears throat> that was an outfit I brought back from Hawaii right there. <clears throat> well, it fits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get it. I'll get somebody to burn that off on the computer. <laughs> we'll, we'll get that out there somehow. Wow, that's an old... Hank, is that a P-51 or a P-40? It's just one. Like a B model or something? Yeah. P-40. So you're flying with other guys right there? Yeah. How come when we're flying, we all want to take pictures of other guys flying beside us? I do it too. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we take off and go. It's like that old joke says, that how do you find out at a cocktail party who a pilot, which guy's a pilot? <laughs> and then the answer is, just wait long enough, he'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, those are some good ones. Yeah, they said. So you just got in any airplane and, oh, there's your Lightning, P-38, your favorite airplane. Yeah, there's a, I guess, there's one picture somewhere of me standing up on the, standing up on it. Well, God, how'd you learn to navigate so well? I mean, so you just said whatever they gave you, you like that, like we said, that P-40 right there is the yeah. most powerful single engine, heaviest single engine airplane ever made. You just got in with no training and took off. Yeah. How'd you learn how to navigate? Hopefully not the same way. Well, when I went <laughs> well you to went to school, didn't you? Yeah, college. Right. Right there, learned navigating here. There's the B-17, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Henry. Mm -hmm. That's your girlfriend? Before you met the <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's my girlfriend. <laughs> There's a naked... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody from Africa, I would North imagine. Africa. <laughs> North Africa. <laughs> you were in North Africa? Yeah. yeah was, was this a date or just happened to be walking by? <laughs> <laughs> just happened to be walking by. <laughs> yeah. That looks like a Connie. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. It's Concord. Yeah. Lockheed Constellation. Yeah. You've had quite a career flying, haven't you, Hank? Yeah, yes, yes. You like sitting in airplanes still? I mean, that, I, I can't get enough of it. Don't you like it? Yeah. It sure feels at home, doesn't it? Yeah. It seems to me that no matter what's going on that day, that the minute you leave the ground, I forget everything. It's a different world. You just forget everything. Yeah. There's your favorite one again, P-38 Lightning. Huh, from Burbank, California. Gosh. That's a DC-3 or something? That is, yeah. That's a DC-3. That's your old workhorse. Yeah. B-25? B-25, elaborator. B-25, that's a... That, uh, 24, the elaborator. Uh, Liberator, they call it. It's actually uh, it's two two different 
birds. There's a Navy version and an Army version of it. One was a B-24 and, and uh, the other one they called it a Liberator. <laughs> the Navy version of it. Flying boxcar? Yeah. I think Marvin Smith, he was my neighbor for years. We had Smith Electric. He was a bombardier in one of these. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow, picture of Waikiki Beach before there was any hotels. Yeah. So you were stationed in Hawaii? No, I just, just, just got his car postcard. Took me 24 down to Australia. Stopped in the water. You day. flew a B-24 from California to Australia? Yeah. God. That's why I was in the very reason. You really liked that, didn't you? Yeah, I enjoy it. Well, Hank, thanks a lot. I look at yeah, these, yeah. and thanks for taking me hunting all those years. Yeah, my pleasure. I enjoyed taking you guys out. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't remember much getting away from us. I remember my dad. Yeah. Going beside me, had to go to the bathroom one time, and. Right out from underneath his rear end, this big chucker, we were waiting for Dad to get done. And this great big pheasant jumped up. Right out from the bush he was squatting in. And you and Jack Blair and me and Kurt and Doug all shot the thing and every one of us missed him. <laughs> and I think Dad was shooting at him with his pants pulled down. And we, every one of us missed him. I remember that like it was yesterday. Because <laughs> we were up in chucker country, we didn't figure on seeing a pheasant up there. <laughs> but we did have a lot of fun riding in the back of that old carpet cleaning van. Good old days. Sitting in the back of that freezing cold carpet cleaning van and laying in a cold duck blind for a half a day. But it was pretty fun. Sure appreciate it. Huh. Some ways I kind of think it was a lot better than it is now. I really uh, do. I know it was. They can watch TV and play on computers, but they can't yeah. go out and do what we did. We, we're all pretty, you know, we could all do quite a bit, and it's guys like you that took the time to teach us, so I thank you. And I thank you for the interview. That's why I came out, I think it means a lot to me. It does, really. Yeah, that's right. And you're an honest man, because Dad told me you went to put some carpet in the house at Dad's house one time, and you pulled back the old carpet, there was an envelope, and you, you walked out and you said, Evan, there's $500 in an envelope hidden underneath the carpet. And he said, that's Mertz, put it back, and just lay the carpet over it, Hank. <laughs> it's probably still there. <laughs> so we had, we had one of those neighborhoods where there was probably 30 kids, and you guys made us yeah, mow the lawn, and do guys paint, always, we were always painting houses, or stealing somebody's dog, or stealing somebody's Easter eggs, or something. Throwing golf ball, or... Uh, Baseball through my windows. <laughs> I don't ever remember getting in trouble though. I never remember anybody getting mad at us. No, not really. That's that's that uh, 24 I took to Australia, right there. Really? Yeah. I recognize it. Some of the pictures with it. That's the one I flew to Australia. Wow. Well, you had a lot of boy, good adventures. There you are, Henry. That's the one you were looking at for. Standing on the P-38. Oh, lighting. yeah, yeah, that's it. That's a nice picture. Yeah. Yeah, I see it on the I knew there was one in there somewhere. I'm going to hold that one up in front of the little movie camera and try to hold it still. Maybe we can, maybe we can get a picture off the computer. That's a good one here. That's Hank's favorite plane right there, he's P-38. There we go. 
go. What suppose? What year do you suppose that is, Hank? What year? Yeah, just about what year? Well, I've been. Uh, uh, what? Uh, when was uh, Pearl Harbor? What year? Nineteen forty-one. Forty-one. Yeah, being 43, 44. Huh. Or 43, I'd say. And you just yeah. jumped in that one too and learned how to fly it by yourself. Yeah. I just got orders to go out and. <laughs> <laughs> sure played okay. Yeah. Sure playing, go with it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll shut this thing off, Hank. Yeah. All right, Hank, here we go. Now this is Henry Harvey with his hula skirt on. You got it yeah, at Christmas yeah. Island, you say? <laughs> here it is. We're looking at his old album here. Yeah. I'll try to I'll try to zoom in on this. He's quite a handsome girl. <laughs> if you can see it. <laughs> he's got his hula skirt on and he's yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's got a date, evidently. Yeah, that's, that's, uh -huh. There you go. Let's turn her back to that first page, Hank, and I'll film that picture of you by your, just when you're, with your, there we go. All right, Hank, there you go. There's Hank when he's in the service around Pearl Harbor time, or before that a little bit. There we go. Yeah, what's left of him? What's left of him? Yeah, wings. Oh yeah. RCAF. There's this Canadian that he was talking about earlier. This is his scrapbook. He flew actually all over the world. Quite a story. All right, Henry, we're done. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I just finished the interview with Hank, and I'll tell you, that was a that was a lot of fun. When I was a little kid, we lived in the same neighborhood that the Harveys did, and it's just one of those things that we're all real true locals and just had a blast. Lots of good memories, and I took Hank for the airplane ride simply because I wanted to. Uh, it's a, kind of a an aviator thing. That man has so much experience to, to get into an airplane that he's never flown and to ferry it from California to Hawaii, fill it up and on on over to Japan or wherever he said he went. I can't even remember right now, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, he went to Australia on that trip. But anyway, um, getting in some of you guys that no aviation, getting in a P-40 or a P-51 or a P-38 Lightning, which he said was his favorite airplane, or a B-17 bomber or a B-25 bomber, never even been in it in his life. Just read the instructions, picked up his orders, and took off. That's amazing. And I, you know, the flights he made at Schlant Airways were something else, and some of the stories, and then he took us hunting um, all the time. You'd walk down the street and be Hank, gonna take us hunting. And uh, you always came home with a bag of birds, I'll tell you that. And when we do, when we went by ourselves, we just came home with an empty box of shells. So it was a real fun thing to do that with Hank, and I appreciate his family letting me do that. It's funny because you don't have to be the year 2007 politically correct. Uh, it was just. It was just a blast to take a step back, and those are probably not as politically correct times, but they were better times. And as I was leaving and packing up my little camera and the couple little airplanes that Henry signed for me, I'll be damned if he isn't standing out there smoking a cigarette. <laughs> so. Uh, He's a tough guy. He's made out of the, you know, like, I guess the right stuff. And he's, he's going to be that way until the last day. It's, it's, in, it's just incredible the kind of a man that he is and the gentleman that he is.
don't ever remember Hank ever getting mad at anybody. Uh, he always did the right thing and took the time for us kids and taught us a lot, showed us a lot of adventures, and uh, just someday I'd like to grow up to be as good as him. I'll, I'll tell you that. I, it was a true privilege, and uh, I really didn't want to make anything about myself on here, um, but I did want to take the time after doing it to say what a privilege it is and was to do this and to do that flight with Hank. Um, a guy with so many hours flying, that was a true honor for me to get to take him flying, and uh, I enjoyed it. So, thanks, Henry, and. Uh, I'll bet you we do it again. All right. Thank you again.